Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today to our third quarterly membership meeting. I'm Julie Hedrick. I'm the APFA National President. Larry, you want to introduce yourself? Hi everyone. Welcome. I'm Larry Salas, APFA National Vice President. It's great to have everyone here today. Thank you. And Josh? Hey everyone. Uh, APFA National Secretary Josh Black. Really happy to have all of you. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this uh, membership meeting is recorded. So we don't want you to have to worry about taking notes furiously. Um, we will not only just record this, we will put the PowerPoint out on the website so you'll have both of them. So please just sit back, relax, and enjoy the meeting today. We also, with our video, we will separate each department so that if you really want to hone in on what retirement is saying or what hotel is um, has information has for you, you'll be able to do that um, with this recording. Today, each department will talk about one to three hot topics that they have in their department. They want to help you with your jobs today. So we've got everyone here. We've got a couple on virtually, um, but I hope that the information helps you with your job. Before we get started, we want to show you our new APFA pin. Um, it is being received very well by the membership. You can get those pins from your base leadership, your base president, your base vice president. Our contract action team members also will have the, pen, the pins for you and your national officers. So hopefully we'll get those out to you really soon. And always don't forget to always wear your union pin when you are at work. Every time you come to work, you should have your union pin on. Don't forget we're in negotiations and how important that is. Speaking of negotiations, this is not a negotiations town hall. So we do not have an update for you today on negotiations. But before we get started, we just want to take you to the website and remind you of where you can find information on what's going on in negotiations today. So if you go to APFA.org and at the top, you will see negotiations. And once you click on there at the top of this bar, you have multiple choices, but we're going to for today and for time's sake, we're just going to go to negotiation status and just walk you through that a little bit. So on this page, you will see the sections that we have that are open, the sections that are tabled, and the sections that have been agreed to. And at the very top of the page, we have a small opener that we did recently. Uh, these are sections that we are currently working on. And um, those, every single section that we have on the website, there is a drop down for you, uh, for you to get more information on what's happening. Let's go to one of the sections that is open, Josh. Uh, how about we just go to scheduling? And here you can see on the left side is what we're proposing, and on the right side, what the management proposal, what their response is to the proposal. So hopefully you've all um, already become familiar with that. We also are sending out hotlines after every session that we have with uh, negotiations. Right now, ne uh, negotiations, number uh, 18 hotline we're working on and that will be out very soon <laughs> so uh let's get started today because we have a lot of information to share with you first up is Alos Alyssa Kovacs and she is our contract action team admin hello um so I just want to briefly talk about what contract action is um you may have been being our uh, contract action badge backers and the QR code. That's probably how you're most familiar with our, uh, our team. So as you know, we are engaged in um, section six negotiations with American Airlines. What contract action is, is we are committed to full transparency throughout this entire negotiation process, as Julie highlighted in our um, negotiations website. What contract action or CAT does is we work alongside our negotiators to spread um, factual information in easy to understand format. We've all tried to read the hotlines. We've all tried to read our contract. It is difficult, tough language to get through. So what we're doing is we're breaking that down in a much more easily digestible um, format. So when you sign up for contract action, you are signing up to be an activist. We are building this army as mobilization force. So that is really what we're focusing on here. Um, when you do sign up, you can choose your level of involvement. If you just want to commit to staying up to date with the information and reading your hotlines, yes, please. Knowledge is power. If you want to hand out badge backers and pins, yes, we need that as well. We need people talking to their crews, 
if you want to join us in solidarity uh, movements, we have that opportunity for you as well. So there's varied levels of involvement. Also this morning, we did send out a hotline um, that goes into a little bit more detail about what contract action is. So if you're interested in what we've been doing and becoming involved, also check that out as well. So um, our method is a peer-led face-to-face conversations. We are so quickly here and there traveling, working with different people that I think we kind of miss out on um, that connection. So we're focusing and doing like terminal walks and having everyone create that face-to-face -face connection. We are engaging and leading. We are not educating. We will not tell anyone how to vote or how to feel. We are simply putting out this information for ourselves. We are building a foundation and an informed voter base. Um, this is because we are going to be leading up to a strike vote. We are going to be leading up to pickets. We need to build this army. Striking is our tactic and solidarity is our power. We need people to show up physically. And then also when we're working, wearing the pins, that is a beautiful show of force. Also, we are using um, social media. Um, as a way to build this show of solidarity. So if you haven't already, you are able to follow APSA Unity on Instagram. And we encourage you to um, tag us in your pictures, wearing your pins, handing out your badge backers. Um, we want to have this beautiful show of force. So these are just some examples of um, the kind of stories and the way the flight attendants are utilizing this new form of media. Currently, um, Contract Action just launched our latest campaign yesterday. We are putting out these cat cards, as we call them, and it goes into a little bit more detail about some of the proposed and tabled items that is on the negotiations website. So our cat ambassadors are in base. They are handing these out. This image will be circulating um, throughout social media. So if you have any questions, um, please reach out to um, Contract action at APFA.org and also email your negotiators. We really want there to be a good back and forth um, conversation there. So thank you and please sign up for contract action. Thank you so much, Alyssa. I will say I'm so happy every time I move back and forth uh, every week. Uh, the flight attendants on our flights, as well as all the flight attendants while we've been out doing base visits, everybody is informed. It, it is so encouraging to see how many of our flight attendants are reading the hotlines, going to the website, and really the contract action team is a big part of that. So great work, and um, we have a lot more work to do. Yes, we do. All right, next up is Lori Vito Gottlieb. She is our government affairs uh, specialist. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. The next big piece of legislation the government affairs um, committee is working on is the FAA reauthorization bill of 2023. And this bill funds the FAA in conjunction with other legislation that has passed. This is really a great opportunity for flight attendants because we can make changes to our health and safety. We can make changes to improve health and safety in our work environment. What we would like to see in the FAA reauthorization bill are listed on this slide, but I'll just only go over a couple of them. So for example, we'd like cabin air quality. The goal is to recognize human events in real time and to set a standard reporting system on fumes so that we can track them and understand where they're coming from and that everybody is involved in the aviation industry so that we can um, help stop these fume events. Um, another thing that's important to us and I'm sure it's important to you is cabin temperature standards. So we would like to adopt temperature standards set by the American Society of Heating, Refrigerating and Air Conditioning Engineers. They say the standards on an aircraft on board an aircraft should be between 65 and 80 degrees. Um, we would like to redo the updated evacuation standards. When the FAA authorized CAMI to do an evacuation, um, they used able-bodied passengers, which really doesn't reflect our passengers and our situations on an aircraft, so we'd like that test redone. And Preventing flags of convenience, which is this is to protect aviation jobs from being um, outsourced. You can always check our website. We will always have um, updated information. Um, we'll have everything that we're working on that you can go and look at. And you can even reach out to us if you'd like to help us, if you want to talk about some of these issues. 
Um, we really would like to hear from you. We can't guarantee that all these issues will be on the FAA reauthorization bill, but we are making our voices heard on Capitol Hill. The next thing we're working on is midterm elections 2022, and it is just around the corner, Tuesday, November 8th. Um, are you registered to vote? We need you to go to www.vote.org, update all your information, and make sure you are registered to vote so you can do your early voting, absentee ballots, or just go in person. Important elections to watch we have on the right-hand side of the slide. These elections will decide who is in the majority in the Senate. And remember, your member of Congress works for you. So it's very important that you vote. Again, if you have any questions, please reach out to the government affairs team. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Um, so you did mention they can reach out to you. How do they reach out to you? They can go to the website. They can go to our government affairs page. And both Allie and I are listed on there. We have phone co contact and email okay. listed. And what's your email? L. Glatly at APFA.org. Okay, thank you. And Lori and Allie Malice are our co-chairs for our governing, uh, government affairs team. Thank you. All right, next up we have Marty McMillan, who is our scheduling chair, and she'll be covering contract and scheduling today. Thank you, Julie. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, real quickly, wanted to give everybody an update about uh, the company who has determined that everyone will be qualified on every piece of equipment now that we do operate, uh, as well as any service qualifications. So that's going to be done in three phases. Right now, we are doing first or only classes, and that's from September through December of this year. And there is a deadline of March 1st of 2023 to get the pursers qualified on all aircrafts, 777 and 787. Any bases that have a 777 or 787 currently flying, uh, that training will begin in January of 2023. And then the third phase will be bases that don't have 777 and or 787 flying. That'll start later in 2023. And they've broken it down. The company sent out a memo and we've sent out a hotline as well. Uh, detailing which bases will be uh, receiving which training and during which phase. So if you have any questions, uh, you can reach out to contract at APFA.org and we'll be happy to let you know what's coming uh, your way. So if you don't want to get drafted to go to training, you can always ballot for training and we've put together a little step-by-step -step on how to ballot for a 777 or 787 class. It's actually fairly simple uh, to do, and the instructions are right here, and that will be sent out in this pack that we're sending out. Uh, one thing we would like to point out um, was that the training for both the 777 and the 787 for most bases is going to require two calendar days for training. So just make sure that you keep those days free on your schedule if you would want to attend one of those and you're bidding for those. Uh, before, that was not communicated. It was causing some issues for folks not being able to get into a class. Now, from the scheduling side, uh, we often get lots of phone calls during IROPS, especially about not receiving phone calls from crew scheduling when there's a change to your schedule. And that's listed under JCBA Section 10 J 3 D. And I've uh, put up the actual language from the contract. And so what we are finding, though, is a lot of our flight assistants are just left hanging, especially in IROPs. They don't get a phone call from crew scheduling, letting them know what they're supposed to do. The other issue is even on a blue sky day, we're also hearing that flight assistants are not getting phone calls when they have an extensive mechanical or if they misconnect or some other delay uh, that causes them to have a disruption to their sequence. They're still not getting phone calls. We do not have electronic notification in this contract, which means positive contact is required on the part of crew scheduling. So in order for us to really push back on the company uh, with this, we've decided to create a small, uh, very short form very easy to complete. It'll be on the landing page of the APFA website. 
You don't even have to log in to APFA.org. You can just go on the landing page, complete the form, and this will enable us to keep all the data that we need to collect uh, in one centralized location. Because right now, what happens is uh, some folks call the crew scheduling the, or the uh, contract scheduling desk here at APFA. Some are calling their base, but we need one place where we can really hone in on these types of violations of our contract and uh, really track it so that we can move forward in whatever means we need to go forward with. Thank you. Thanks, Marty. I know we've sent out a hotline on this a few times, yes. right? And yes. I know a lot of our flight attendants today are carrying that around with them, yes. or they've screenshotted it. Um, so uh, the last time we did a Chicago-based visit, we were, there was a IROPS happening, and everybody there pretty much knew um, that, you know, the contract, right, which is really great to see. Yeah. Um, not to say the hotline tells you exactly what the company is supposed to do. Um, as we all know, like Mar Marty said, that's not happening a lot. And so that's why we really need to start tracking this um, and we need that information. Um, and especially because I know in some cases they're giving our flight attendants mi uh, missed trips, yes. right? Um, and so a that is not acceptable to say the least, and this is how we will get it corrected. Um, I just want to remind everyone also, you can take screenshots of the slides if you would like. Um, I forgot to mention that at the start, but if you want the information today and you don't want to wait till it's out on the website, you can screenshot it and uh, keep it with you all at all times. Thank you, Marty. Um, I know I'm just going to say we have um, the update to our website is coming soon as far as on the job, right? Um, and really when you started talking about this, this is one of the most exciting things I'm happy about on the website. When flight attendants are out there, you're not gonna have to scroll through hotlines to try and find the hotline. You're gonna be able to go to on the job, rescheduling, and find all the information there. So we're not quite there yet, but it should be here in a couple of months. Yep. Right, thanks Josh. All right. We're moving on to the health department and our national health chair is Kathy Sharp. Hello everyone. Uh, today I want to talk about one of our most, uh, what we're seeing most questions about currently, which is family leave. With, um, with all the new flight attendants coming in, um, they, I wanted to clarify that you must be employed for 12 months in order to be able to have, apply for family leave. You also have to have 504 hours on duty hours. Um, these are calculated from sign-in to debrief each day from the sequence, including sit time. Layover time is not counted. Uh, actual duty time is included, not the greater of the schedule or actual. Uh, eight hours is credited for each day of training. Scheduled time for each trip removal, APAG for APFA removal. And flight attendants on special time is received five hours. And these our, your FMLA hours are on a rolling 12 month calendar. So you do, you know, you can actually see this in the my view. You can check and see what your FMLA hours are. Um, another thing we get a lot of questions about is um, what qualifies for family leave. Um, so if I, I have to see a, a treating physician within the first seven days of my absence, my, the absence has to be more than three days have to have a follow-up visit for a block leave within that within 30 days or some type of treatment there's a long list. Um, one of the things we want to stress the importance of is that the healthcare provider form is to be filled out by your healthcare provider. Um, it's, I know you want to be helpful, but this is uh, this is important that they they do this because it can cause you a lot of problems otherwise. So if you have any questions about family leave, if you're having issues getting any processed or uh, anything, please feel free to reach us at help at APFA.org. Thank you, Kathy. Okay. So we're moving on to Valia Paxson, who is our IOD uh, National Chair. Hi, everyone. Um, in the IOD department, Get quite a few questions, but as of lately, we are being asked, what is light duty? What is restricted duty? What do I do? Um, in all the states, uh, they, the doctors are required 
to give you a work status. And she's not doing the state, you know, restrictions, life duty, and that just simply means that you're off work and you're calling sick. Um, Sedgwick is the workers' comp insurance and American. They are aware that there is no light duty or restricted duty. It's just not an option for flight attendants. So you will remain off work until um, your doctor releases you to full duty. Now, in the early stages of the claim, you know, Cedric will look, review all your medical and they will determine whether your claim will be accepted or not. And if your claim is accepted, then Cedric will notify American and then American would recode you to an IOD. And if you have any other questions, you can reach us at um, iod at apfa.org or go on to the APFA website, go to departments and scroll down to IOD and we have a lot of answers for you there. Thank you, Belia. Okay, next up we have our safety chair and that is Andrew Reinhardt. Thank you. Hello everyone. Hot topic, no one can remember. Uh, so corporate security sends APFA safety and security a list every month of all the KCM violations. And those are audits of for using KCM for international personal travel. The company has implemented a three-step course of action in response to each KCM violation. The first one is a coaching council. The second, you could lose that uh, privilege for 90 days, and then on the third, you could lose it for a 12 month period. So we really don't even want the first violation to happen. But if you have any questions, you would go to the KCM website for rules. It's also on our web page on APFA, but a common scenario that we're asked is, I'm going on vacation and traveling Chicago, Dallas, Lima. Can I use KCM in Chicago? No, you must go through a regular security screening checkpoint in Chicago. No matter what, you have to use regular TSA on the day of your travel. And then I have another question that comes up. And again, these are just examples. Uh, I commute internationally. Can I use KCM the last day of my sequence and then exit and go through regular security before commuting? Since the company cannot see your PNR that you exited the secured area and re-entered via a regular excuse me, a screening checkpoint, you, you should not use KCM on the last day of your sequence. Again, any questions, you can visit KCM website or our website. So inadvertent slide deployments are on the rise. Please continue to utilize your procedures like monitor and challenge and be mindful of all distractions and to cross check your fellow crew members at all times when possible. We know it's difficult nowadays. People try to rush the uh, boarding door when it's time to exit the aircraft for their connections, but please try to be mindful of those procedures and any distractions that may arrive. And if you are noticing in your pre and post flight checks, if there are any maintenance concerns found if the slide bustle doesn't look like it's been attached to the door frame correctly, or if the GERP bar on the 737, our favorite airplane, isn't getting into the slide brackets very well, make sure to inform the captain as well as complete a cabin ASAP report as a, either a specific safety concern or a maintenance concern. And that brings me to cabin ASAP reporting. It's not only used for confidential self-disclosure of an FAR procedural or, excuse me, FAR violation or a procedural violation. It is also the most effective way to report all safety concerns. The Cabin ASAP Event Review Committee, and I have one of the members here, Barrington Johnson, uh, along with the FAA, collects and tracks all safety concerns and violations to determine if procedural changes are necessary. The Cabin ASAP program is the most efficient way and the most effective way to enact change. So we ask that every safety concern that you may have, that could be hot cabin, fatigue. If you find that a trip has been built that's causing any kind of fatigue for you, please report that via cabin ASAP. It is not only for any FAR procedural violation, it's all safety concerns. And that leads me here. Well, um, you can, like she said earlier, you can take a screenshot to have this for you, um, or you can visit our website and get it. But we have QR codes that'll be available with the slides. One will take us to the new web page on APFA for safety. The other will take you to the cabin ASAP program. We really like our QR codes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I love them. I know I have the contract action team badge on with me, badge backer on with me all the time. And we've got on the back of that one our QR codes for contract action team sign up, right? And for negotiations, now we've got our safety QR codes. Who's next? Huh? <laughs> All right. Barrington Johnson is here and he is our ACT ARC specialist and he's going to talk to you today about a few items. Oh, there we go. 
um, what's going on with ACTAR. Okay, thank you, Judy. Good morning, everyone. ACTAR, Air Carrier Training Aviation Rulemaking Committee. As most of you probably remember, on December 30th of 2021, we put into action and was announced to the public of a de-escalation training. We're still in the process right now of informing all airlines CEOs. We're meeting with A4A next week in Washington, D.C. We're meeting with the FAA in the coming months. And we're making sure everyone knows what this de-escalation training is. It will be involved. All U.S. flight attendants will be taking part in this training. It will be a mandatory training in the coming years. But it starts sometime next year. As soon as we get the dates of when it goes into effect, we'll let everyone know. Uh, next week, the legislative, the government affairs team and myself will be traveling to uh, Seattle, Washington. We're going to museum a flight for a two-day workshop group on AWU, all wheels up. This is for disability customers that we have traveling. We recently found out that about 45% of Americans with disability chooses not to fly because they don't feel safe. So this group, which is formed within the FAA, will be meeting with them to invite them to tell us what their apprehensions are, just like a fearful flyer, and for us to work with them in having them travel on board our flights throughout the United States. So Lori and Ali and myself will be going out next week to Seattle to attend this conference, and we're also part of the working group. APFA has been invited to be part of that group along with AFA, so we'll both be taking part in that. Thank you. Thank you, Barrington. All right. Larry, oh no, sorry, Larry, you don't have a different. Oh no, you have SBA. <laughs> Just kidding. All right. Uh, we have Danny Moon here with us today, and he's representing the hotel department. Hello, everyone. In the previous all member meetings, we discussed transportation and a general overview of our department and a market spotlight. Today, we'd like to provide some information about the layover market reviews and inspections. So what prompts a review? Flight attendant feedback and data that's gathered through the feedback reports, a contract expiration, either, either the company or the hotel deciding not to renew or terminate a contract, plan major construction or renovations. If there is a new layover city being added or a market where we need additional rooms, that can also prompt a review. And finally, APFA, or APA can request that a market be sourced for a review. One second. So what we wanted to do next was just give you an indication of some of the market conditions that impact our ability to source and contract with hotels. We wanted to share some of these observations. It's no secret that staffing continues to be a challenge. That can impact housekeeping, front desk operations, food outlets, and shuttle services. Leisure demand remains strong, which is driving up room rates, making it less lucrative to lock in rates for crew business. In addition, as business and group travel returns, hotels are reviewing their ideal business mix, which may include fewer rooms for crew. Most hotels are only open to a certain percentage of rooms being allocated for crew business, and we aren't the only airline out there that's looking for accommodations. So while a hotel may have rooms to sell to the public, we may not have access to all of those rooms. To give you an idea of the reviews that have been conducted and are anticipated, we've completed 49 reviews so far this year. Some of the larger cities require multiple visits due to the large number of rooms or hotels that we need and the need for long versus short properties. On the right side, you'll see some of the reviews that are scheduled for uh, the next several months. If you'd like to submit input for any of these cities, please email us at hotel at apfa.org. And then if you have specific feedback following a layover, please use the feedback form located at this short link, apfa.org slash hotel form. Thank you. 
Thanks, Daniel. Okay, I got a quick question. Sure. I'm not sure you can answer it. But what would you say is the favorite hotel of the five to ten that would get great, great reviews about? Do you have one? Can you think of one? I, and I'm sorry to put you on the spot on that. But I just, People really like the Prince in Honolulu. Okay. Um, the new one in Chihuahua is getting great reviews. Good. And uh, where else? The Austin Marriott gets good yeah, reviews. Great. Or, Very good. Okay. Well, I know you guys are doing really good work over there. I know hotels have been a hot topic for the last couple of years. Um, obviously, lack of being able to get a hotel has been the hottest topic, sure. um, mostly when you're rescheduled or canceled. Uh, it seems like it's gotten a little better. Uh, there's more flight attendants who are moved on that SA working in that department these days, as well as they have quite a few more um, hotel uh, limo to work with the desk. So I know we're still not there yet. Still hear people uh, talking about Biz Hero. Um, and really, at the end of the day, we're hoping that this is uh, this hotel issue is solved very soon. So thank you for all the work you do. I, I Go ahead. Quick update. Speaking of hotel and our challenges in the past, we do have a presidential grievance. Uh, on crew accommodations that's scheduled to be heard on um, February um, 21st and 22nd of um, next year. Thanks, Larry. Um, yeah, I know, unfortunately, uh, it takes us a while to get the presidential grievances scheduled. I know Larry can probably fill you in a little bit more on why it takes so long. Um, not necessarily, it's not the union. I can tell you we want to hear them as soon as possible. So uh, we filed that grievance with the pilots um, uh, at the same time, and I don't believe theirs has been heard either. Yet. So um, it's taken me too. All right, thank you. All right, next we're moving on to Deb McCormick, and she is our EAP for that specialist. Hi, um, good afternoon. So I wanted to just talk a little bit about the Flight Attendant Drug and Alcohol Program. Um, we just had our conference last month, August 23rd through 25th. Uh, at the conference, we had 376 participants, 26 attendees from American Airlines, yay, and we had 21 airlines in attendance. Oops, sorry. Mm -hmm. It's not going. But anyway, I can talk through it. Yeah. Okay. So I'm sorry about that. Um, so if you go out, have the opportunity, please get onto our website. It's www.fedap.org. We, um, and in the website, you're going to find a, a plethora of information available to the flight attendants. Uh, and family members. We're a program that services not only the flight attendant himself, but also the family members who have questions or concerns. You can always call um, in at 855-333-2321 or 855-33-FADAP. Um, we, the Flight Attendant Drug and Alcohol Program works you know, gives another flight attendant another option. So right now here at American Airlines, we know we have the APFA EAP program. We also know that we have Optum, I mean, excuse me, I'm sorry, Aetna, okay. which is our behavioral health plan that we can call in and we can receive up to four free sessions. But we also have FDAP. So, and these are all confidential resources. So again, here's the number. Thank you very much. We have, and you have one more slide. We found the slides. And yeah, I did. Okay. And we want to talk a little bit about the wings of sobriety. Now, we have individuals who might be looking or are in recovery. We have confidential 12, I mean, meetings, and it doesn't necessarily mean to be 12 step. It's a level of support. And these are you know, for all flight attendants. So it doesn't matter if you're an American Airlines flight attendant, Hawaiian, United, you know, Envoy, it doesn't matter who you are, that you can call in and speak to somebody uh, who is also in recovery 
and you know find out you know how do you manage recovery as a flight attendant so this is another option and we go, we do have a zoom meeting available which is also on sunday and it's listed on our website and another meeting to come um, you're welcome josh and i attended the fedat conference um many of our flight attendants it was an excellent conference to visit and it is a great resource for our for help for our flight attendants um, this information is also on our website. Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. All right. Next up, we have Jillian Bosenta, and she is our professional standards uh, specialist. Thank you, Julie. Good morning. Um, the past several years, we have actually seen quite an increase in calls to our department. And in a sense, I see that as a positive in that all flight attendants are utilizing this resource rather than going to the company to intervene. Um, when a call comes in, we reiterate that this is a confidential, non-punitive way to address conflict with another flight attendant or pilot. We are your peers. We are trained to assist with any conflict resolution. We want to be the first course of action when a problem or question arises. Your union is here to assist and to help to figure out the best course of action when dealing with conflict with another employee. Um, by ignoring a situation, nothing can be done about it. By addressing it, we can hopefully discuss with the parties involved and help to come up with a solution agreeable to everyone that's involved. Um, I as well use each call as a learning experience myself. Again, this is confidential peer-to-peer -peer discussion. We're here to help and keep the company from intervening. Uh, we also work very closely with APA, the Pilots Union Professional Standards reps, as well as our own EAP and DE&I departments. We'll consult on situations and um, have it addressed by the department that is um, you know, necessary for that situation. The calls range in issues, but nevertheless, we always encourage a discussion to figure out uh, if it's something that we can do, something we can address, or if we need to point the caller into another resource um, and how to get to that resource as well. Your professional standards reps and their emails and phone numbers can be easily found on the APFA website by going to the three line icon on the left navigating to departments and scrolling to professional standards, where on the bottom of the page, you'll see a blue line, which will take you to all of our names and um, how to communicate with us, whether it's email or our phone numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm very confident in the success of the program. We um, have meetings all the time to discuss some predominant issues that arise and um, we encourage the use of this whenever the need arises. Please feel free to call us at any time. Thank you. Thank you, Jillian. Okay, next up we have our DE&I committee and we have Chadrian Calhoun and Rhonda Kurt right here today to uh, talk about it. Hello everyone, I'm Chadrian Calhoun, DE&I co-chair. Just want to talk a little bit about what we've been doing in the past couple months and what we'll be doing going forward. Um, for the last couple months, uh, we've been able to talk about a hot topic that's come in to our department from our membership um, centered around um, representation within the union and what that means and how we can shift that going forward. Um, I want to first thank our officers for seeing the need for this committee. Um, that is a display of commitment to change and really being um, forthcoming and how those changes can happen. Um, so the first month we had a conversation around diversity and then the next month we had a conversation around inclusion. And the takeaways from that were that we need to have very thorough and accurate training for all representation here at APFA so that each member that's actually supporting other members can be informed and empowered on how to support. And another takeaway was as we're recruiting for people to occupy these seats of representation that we keep diversity, equity, and inclusion in mind. So it is our commitment here within the DNI commit um, committee to hold accountable our leadership towards that goal and towards that end. Um, we also want to hear back from you. So look forward to a series of surveys that are going to be coming forth. The first one is going to be a census just because we understand in order to serve you appropriately, we need to know who you are and how things 
impact your life, not only here at American Airlines, but at home as well, because if it impacts you at home, it's going to impact the way that you work. In addition to that, we want to see you face to face. So look forward to us on October 13th in DFW doing a terminal walk just so that we can hear from you face to face about the issues that are impacting you, impacting your life and how they impact us here at APFA. And Ron is going to talk about what we're doing next. It is Hispanic, National Hispanic Heritage Month. It starts September 15th, but it's until October 15th. And this month, we are going to get out there. We hope that you all will join us. We're going to be in Dallas on October 13th. We'll hold our monthly meeting there virtually as well, but we're going to go out into the city and visit the Latino Cultural Center downtown and we'll also go to the exhibit of Octavio, Octavio Medallion and that's going to be at the Dallas Museum of Art. Please join us. We'd love to have you. And we want to remind you of our meetings. We have our meetings virtually the second Thursday of every month. And again, we're going to be having it virtually at the airport. Please come if you can and join us in the event. It'll still be virtual. We'll, we'll still get on, but join us and if you can join us online as well. And we will be talking about equity. We'll be moving out of inclusivity, moving into equity. And we're also going to introduce how language affects how we perceive others, how we are treated and how we treat others. So we hope that you join us and as always, you are welcome. <coughs> And please reach out to us. So we have the website up there. It's DEI at APFA.org. Next up, we have Kim Tack, who is our retirement specialist. Hi, everyone. Well, it has been a long, hot, stressful summer, <laughs> and that has driven a lot of flight attendants to call me and find out, say, how do I know if I'm eligible to retire? <laughs> if I want to retire right away. So I'm going to review the company's criteria to be eligible to retire, which is known as the 65-point plan. <laughs> Basically, um, the 65-point plan, it's part of company policy, and it's the same for all employees of the company. Um, it's not contractual, but it's just how the company defines whether someone can be a retiree or And the two main criteria are that you have to have at least 10 years of company seniority, and this is based on your date of hire. Your date of hire seniority is not affected by leaves of absence or anything like that. And in fact, if you're on a leave of absence and you're eligible for the 65 point plan, you can retire from your leave of absence. Um, a lot of people call me and ask about that as well. The next criteria, once you have the 10 years of company seniority, is that your age plus your years of service must equal 65 or more. That's where they get the 65 point. So, uh, what does this get you? Well, it gets you the ability to be considered a, an American Airlines retiree. So that's a status thing. Also, it gets you, the main two benefits it gets you as a flight attendant is it gets you uh, your past privileges. One, and it, a lot of people do not want to retire until they know they're eligible to have their retiree pass privileges. The second thing it qualifies you for is to be paid out for your sick time. If you don't qualify to be a retiree, you do not get paid out at a paltry $8.65 per hour for your sick time. But hey, it's better than nothing. And we are in negotiations and we're trying to improve it. <laughs> <laughs> there are two other things I didn't put on the slide um, that it also gets you, uh, gets you a retiree ID because you're considered a retiree. So when you retire, you get your retiree ID and also a retirement gift. So um, these are your main retirement benefits and that's what you get if you're eligible for the 65 point plan. I do wanna mention that if you have a pension or your 401k, your 401k is yours. It has nothing to do with being able to be a retiree. So if you were to leave the company before you're eligible for the 65 point plan, your 401k is still yours. 
the same if you have a pension. You can be a pensioner and not a retiree. So, and lots of people, most people going forward are going to be a retiree and not have a pension. So, these are all things we need to think about. But um, if you have questions about the 65 point plan and um, want to know, you know, it should be pretty clear. And I want to tell the junior people out there, some senior people have been calling and asking this question, but some more junior people want to know how many years I have to work in order to be able to leave with those passports. So, uh, that's kind of it in a nutshell. And uh, you can reach me at retirement at APFA.org if you have more questions about the 65 point. And if you're interested in uh, hearing more about retirement, we have a retirement town hall on Monday. A hotline will be following um, either today or tomorrow announcing that instructions on how to join. And we have many videos on the APFA website, on the APFA website from the previous town halls um, that Kim has conducted. So um, Kim has been very busy. Uh, I'm going to say the last two and a half years, uh, probably more than that. But I know it's been a really couple uh, busy couple of years for the three time. So thank you. Okay, we're moving on to Adam Brooks, who is our national ballot chair. Yep, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to give a few quick updates. Not a lot going on currently, but we did conduct a special election to fill the remaining term for our SFO based vice president. Uh, this is our first election with our new vendor, Yes Elections, that we signed with uh, last year, and it went extremely well. So very pleased with the experience we had with them so far. Um, just some work we've been doing behind the scenes. We've electronically compiled the past 10 plus years of election results and data for our internal data system here at APFA. So it makes it very easy to access all past election uh, results. Uh, we also finished um, revamping our web page, which will be launched when the new website um, comes out in a few months, as mentioned. Um, just that website will be your one-stop shop for all things elections and balloting. Um, we've also compiled all the easy-to-read uh, past election results, so you can easily look back on past elections and see the results of those. Um, Coming up, uh, the next elections is right around the corner, believe it or not, December of this year, 2022, the Willingness to Serve will open for our base officer elections, and that election will take place in March of 2023. And then January of 2023, mm -hmm. Willingness to Serve will open for the uh, uh, place positions, and that will also occur in March of 2023. So it'll be a busy winter and spring for us, but for now, it's uh, business as usual. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Okay, and we have Paul Hartshorn here with us today, who is our National Communications Chair. Hey everybody, Paul Hartshorn, National Communications Chair, Philadelphia based flight attendant. I don't have any slides for you today because I'm sure it's a big third or what my responsibilities are, but I just wanted to say hi and thank you for joining today. Um, we have a lot of information coming out on hotlines. We've also uh, taken the time uh, and uh, actually address the membership feedback on social media about um, doing more on other outlets like Instagram. So I'm hoping that you're following us on Instagram. I have to say admittedly that I am not an expert on it, but I do have uh, representatives that work with me to make sure that that information is there for you at your fingertips right away, because we do know that how we communicate is important. And we also have heard from you that flight attendants want different communications than just emails into their inbox constantly. So we are trying to address that. If you go to APFA Unity on the Instagram, on Instagram, um, everything is updated there. It's not just information about APFA, it's a lot of information about the labor movement in general. And I think that's very important to reiterate because it's something that we need to be aware of. Starbucks, Amazon, other airline unions such as Southwest flight attendants, um, and United flight attendants having days of solidarity coming up. We need to make sure that we are inclusive of labor unions across the country, especially uh, since we're seeing this surge of unionism um, in many areas and many industries. So please check out our, our Instagram at APFA Unity. Um, we update it as much as we can um, for information both for APFA and for uh, industry-wide uh, events across the country. So thank you for tuning in. 
um, and I can always be reached at communications at APFA.org. Have a great day. Thank you, Paul, for mentioning Instagram. I think we're a little over 2,000 followers right now, but I heard yesterday we're trying to get to 5,000 by the end of the year. So if you're not following us on Instagram, please, APFA Unity, um, please follow us on there. It is uh, a little different than Facebook, right? It's quick information. Um, and not everything we put on, in on Instagram is going to go on to Facebook, right? Not everything that's on the hotline is going to go on to Instagram. Um, it, they're definitely a little bit different as to how we are reaching the flight attendants. Um, before we uh, go any further, Larry, I, I was just thinking about this because I know we get this question a lot. You get the question a lot. We have um, a few more presidentials that are scheduled. Um, I know we're always hearing about when is the staffing grievance going to be heard. I'll let you talk about that first, and then if you can give us the date um, for the other presidentials. Yes, so with the um, staffing presidential, it's kind of a complex case due to the research involved um, time studies that have to be done aboard each of the aircraft that we filed um, uh, in the presidential grievance. So there's a process that we're working through with that, working with our board of directors. And, um, uh, it, you know, I, I, I'll say it, it's quite costly. So we're, we're trying to look at every avenues of how we can um, present that case um, most effectively. Um, we're hoping that by early next year, uh, we may be able to uh, schedule uh, that uh, presidential to go forward. In the meantime, we do have um, some of our older presidentials um, co-pairing. Uh, that is scheduled to be heard on November 9th and 10th. We also have the FMLA caregiver presidential um, that is scheduled to be heard on December 6th and 7th. And then I previously told you about the um, crew accommodation that's coming up in uh, February. Um, the newest presidential, um, actually that the company filed on us, the management grievance presidential, um, we are in the process of uh, scheduling that. Um, we do have an arbitrator selected for that. Unfortunately, she doesn't have dates available. Um, until early next year. And previously, when we spoke to our um, quarterly system board uh, arbitrator, because um, uh, uh, for, for those of you that don't know, the, the reason why that grievance was brought forward by the company was that they were, uh, they maintained that um, we were not following the language of the uh, JCBA in section 30 and 31, which in fact we are. And we've been trying to schedule numerous contract violation um, uh, cases to be heard at our quarterly system board. First was in June, where they initially refused to hear some of our cases, and that followed through to um, August. And here we are in November now. So we did have a meeting with our uh, quarterly system board arbitrator um, about a month ago, and he instructed both the company and the union. To, um, to either come to a settlement, schedule the management grievance, or he would have to make a decision on these outstanding cases for November quarterly system board. So we're, we have quite a few cases. Needless to say, the companies kept us very busy with these contract violations. Um, I'll also say this, <laughs> as I've stated in previous hotlines, we've had a, a significant up uptick in terminations. So um, the SBA department is very busy. So we're trying to get that management. Um, we even uh, suggested to the company um, to swap out um, the co-pairing presidential in November so we could hear that management grievance prior to November quarterly system board and possibly get you know to a resolution. So we're not you know, backlogged with all these cases that the company is refusing to hear. Um, they're still not cooperating. They're still delaying the process. Um, so uh, APFA's uh, in-house attorney 
um, is uh, pushing them to, uh, you know, uh, really come to uh, an agreement on setting, uh, expediting this whole process, because that was the whole idea, is to get this management grievance heard in a timely manner so we could get to all the other cases that are being held up because of this management grievance. So that's basically where we're at now. Um, and hopefully, you know, we'll get, we'll get the company to start moving on. Thank you very much, Larry. Okay, uh, with that also, I want to let everyone know that our next quarterly mem membership meeting will be November 9th this year. So you can put that on your calendars for the next meeting. Um, we're looking forward to that. And please, please stay informed. Um, we are working hard to give you as much information as we possibly can about negotiations. This is something different that we have not done in the past. And I'm really happy with this response. I've heard from the majority of our flight attendants that this is really helping them to understand not only the process, but what we're, what we're proposing. So I wanna end this meeting today by thanking all of you here today and thanking everyone on this call for all your hard work. Uh, we know that this has been a really difficult couple of years. Uh, we are still dealing with the effects of COVID in the job that we do today. And um, we are, we need everyone, everyone on this call and all flight attendants to join us and to stay informed and to make sure that you realize that this union, we are all part of this union and that we are only going to be achieved the best contract we absolutely can get for everyone if everyone is involved. So please stay involved. I wanna to end today remembering our 25 flight attendants, our eight pilots and three customer service agents that died on September 11th. This past weekend, we were at the Pentagon in the Capitol, in New York City at the 9-11 Memorial, in Shanksville, here in Grapevine, and in San Diego, remembering those that lost their lives on that day. Today and every day, we honor their memory, and we will never forget. Thank you all for joining us. Please fight safely. Hi, everyone. Bye.